This is Coffee Country and Cody. From our new home. It's the A-Cup House Studio on the Grand Ole Opry Plaza with the sun pouring in this morning. And I'll be over there in just a little while with Larry Wayne Gatlin, Brother Steve and Rudy, and yeah. Opry Country Classics, Jamie Johnson, Fear the Beard. Jamie is a spotlight artist tonight. We're in that full lineup here in just a little while. Kelly Sutton, Charlie Mattis is on the scene, Annie Nye, studio director, and uh, up there in master control, that's, uh, that's Joel Wilson. He yeah. is in for Jeff Roberts, who's vacationing. And uh, we got Vince Gill from the stage of the Grand Ole Opry coming up here in just a little while. We'll take your memory with you. And uh, it's Don Schlitz's birthday, Opry star and Country Music Hall of Famer, whom just before he went to television, we featured one of his 25 number ones, Almost Goodbye, from Mark Chestnut. Dan Truman of the Opry family with Diamond Rio, keyboard man. Dan's got a birthday today. And Sean Camp in the songwriting community who frequents the Opry with a birthday. Well, I'm surprised you didn't lead with Don's birthday. I thought that was supposed <laughs> to be the very first thing that we mentioned. And uh, who's the, the professional baseball pitcher who brought his dog to the park last night, Charlie? Shohei. Oh, Shohei Atani. Okay. Yeah, not we, a pitcher, I mean, but he's the L.A. Dodgers okay. star. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what position does he play? Uh, well, he's just DHing this year. So, uh, And he plays outfield. Oh, he does actually pitch, too. He does a little bit of everything. but he's Because oh, wow. he's coming off Tommy John, so he's only DHing. But his dog, Decoy, uh, came out and did the first pitch. And uh, we have the correct pronunciation for his dog. Was I not a, close? I thought you, I was you were pretty, pretty close. close. The cuckoo, what, what was it? Um, <laughs> I have no uh, clue what you uh, were saying. Kukerhanja, the Dutch kukerhanja. The last four <laughs> sentences you said made no sense to me whatsoever. You said he's well, I coming for off. These kind of things. You <laughs> said he's coming off Tommy John's and the something something, and then he had his and then decoy. I'm like, I don't know what he's talking about. When it but comes I'm to gonna sports, smile. Kelly is like. Does Go he team. play? Does he play country music? This yeah. is this is I don't like know what's happening right now. When I was still doing the Vanderbilt radio stuff for the women's basketball, and we lost at the SEC tournament, this is when Renee said, "Oh, does this mean no Sweet Sixteen, no brackets?" <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it means. Maybe, huh? yes. Okay. That's exactly what it means. Yes. So, okay. oh, and Charlie, you say. <laughs> Charlie, sixty-two years ago today, what did your son say about Elvis movies? Oh, they're the best. Yeah, that's when he was like four or five. The 10th uh, yes. movie mm -hmm. in Elvis's Hollywood career. Oh, gosh. Kid uh, Galahad. Oh, yeah. Arrived yeah. in theaters. Take yeah. that, ladies, huh? Mm -hmm. If you can stand it, come watch it. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that one. Yeah, it, it, it's okay. Miss that one? Sure. That one's okay. There's okay. a lot of, there's 33 of them. There's only ah. about four you need to watch. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you I'll, know I'll give you your homework if you'd like to okay. know which four. Okay. That sounds good. He's an amateur boxer in Kid Galahad. But his co-star was Charles Bronson. Mm -hmm. Oh. How about that? Yeah. There's a lot happening there. <laughs> One of the great bad guys of all time. Yeah. Hey, coming up, speaking of uh, playing somebody that he's not, Riley Green <laughs> got dressed up for a video with Ella Langley. You can't miss this. It's so good. He looks like he just walked off the set of 1883. And a cameo from Jamie Johnson. Speaking cameo of the from Jamie spotlight Johnson, artist, yeah. Who plays the sheriff and made me laugh out loud. <laughs> Lainey Wilson doing NPR's Tiny Desk. We've got video to show you of that. She sounds great wherever she is. And Chris Stapleton is teasing us with something. We're going to maybe project on what we think it might be. He's going to tell us later today. Coffee, country, and Cody. Add Brandon Heath to the mix this morning from our A-Cup House studio on the Grand Dole Opry Plaza with the sunshine pouring in. Sprinkler system's working well. You can see that outside <laughs> the see studio that, window. yeah. <laughs> and Brandon with a brand new album out next Friday, not this Friday. We got Labor Day. We got a holiday weekend coming up, people. Oh, we do. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Friday, September 6th. Snuck up on us. New single is... Uh, this gospel truth, we'll get to that. Neverland as well. Played the Opry last Friday night. Take us back in time. Oh, and man. And by the way, you're sitting on Ryman Stage Wood here in this studio. As Incredible. Stage, and you stood in that center circle that came from the Ryman when you played the Opry. Oh, I still, I still get chills. I mean, I've only played the Opry probably seven times. Which is, you know, seven more times than a lot of people get to play sure. the Opry. <laughs> but, but honestly, I just, uh, you know, I grew up in Nashville coming, honestly, to Opryland USA when it was a theme park. And, well, uh, I've heard you mention when we were in the Magnolia Lobby studio of the hotel, uh -huh. how many times as a kid you and your family would walk by that room. And Did I tell you about the time I got grounded? Oh, for, because of the stairs? Yeah, 
sliding down the railing of the stairs. For those that don't know this story, make sure that you tell it again. (laughs) Well, actually, to be more accurate, it was my stepbrother that got grounded for sliding down the railing of the stairs. But I went um i went around and around in the revolving door at the at the main entrance there and i I did not realize that there was an old lady that was in there with me trying desperately (laughs) trying to get out oh no (laughs) so yeah i uh i never never have lived that down and if you wonder what happened to minnie pearl now you know now you know what happened to old minnie pearl Cousin yeah. Minnie was trapped in a revolver door <laughs> with Brandon Heath. It's the last we ever heard from her. So do you have memories of this being Mr. Acuff's house? I, I honestly do. I remember walking by wondering who would be lucky enough to, to have a house in the middle of Opryland. Um, but Bill and I were, were talking about the history. I didn't realize that they had built it for him because he was here mm-hmm. so much. Yeah. And he was the ambassador, um, which I think is what a cool role. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and Porter famously took that role because the park was still open after yep. Mr. Acuff died in, mm-hmm. in 94. Oh, he died in 94, 92. So. 94. 94. Okay. He was here 10 years, 84 to 94, I'm pretty wow. sure. And so Porter took that role. Did he ever get to live here? Because, no, no. Porter, Porter, Porter lived on Pennington Bend. Oh, Make a left at the Waffle House, and it'll be down there on your right. <laughs> That's awesome. Is that what yeah. he told people? Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, well, I can't imagine what it would be like, though, to walk by here as a kid and yeah, know that yeah. there's someone that lived I mean, here. That's so cool. Mickey Mouse might as well have lived here. Right? I thought it was so cool. Yeah. I was like, dang, that's so... And honestly, I we never really saw him. I guess he had the... The shades pulled or whatever. Didn't want the tourists looking in his house. But I was like, I wonder if he's really in there or not. Oh, they came in. <laughs> they did. Jerry House famously tells a story about his time here at WSM. And he said a security guard one day pulled him aside as he was finishing up the morning show. And he goes, why, Jerry, people just walked in over there on Mr. A. Cuff. <laughs> <laughs> he was laying there in the bed taking a nap. They was going through his sock drawer. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Oh. You were right, by the oh, way. Nin- late 1992 yeah, is we when were he sitting passed. Here, I was thinking, You're right. Uh, yeah. He moved in in 84. He died okay. in 92. Okay. Uh, and because I knew it was before I got to town and I got here in 94. Mm. And Mildred had passed away. Uh, and so when all that, you know, going, going back to 1973 with the death mm-hmm. of String Bean, mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he lived in Inglewood. Mm-hmm. And now with Mildred gone, he was alone. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Wendell had the idea to set him up. And he did. That's a great idea. Yeah. So where are we in the house? Are we in the kitchen right now? Living room. room. We're We're in the living room. room. Yeah. This is the fireplace. That is awesome. And I'll show you a picture of him sitting here where I am watching TV and his television set was kind of over there. That's crazy. Like like he was on a break from a, a, you know, a park. Poor guy. Appointment of some sort. Loved it. It was like, like a, a top class green room. Like literally, we're not gonna give, we're not gonna give you a green room. We're gonna give you a house, right? That's just so coolest. you can chill. And That's Porter awesome. Porter told me, living close, he said it was just wonderful back in the days of the park and the matinee shows, mm. and you'd come back, you do nighttime shows, and of course yeah. the traditional Friday Saturday. And he said, you know, if I was tired, I could run home, kick back in a recliner for thirty minutes, and be back in five minutes. Yeah, yeah. it's just the most mm. convenient thing. He said, living. And commuting a long distance just yeah. never w- wouldn't work if you were in that capacity yeah. well, as ambassador. And Bill would know this way better than I, but the Opry dressing rooms and backstage much more resembled like a high school gym locker room than the beautiful dressing rooms what we have now. now. So you wouldn't necessarily want to relax back there, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's, that, that's pretty accurate, it right? It like yeah. uh, in just the old metal lockers that you mm-hmm. remember from school. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. a, a high school cafeteria, I yeah. think, is what yeah. Trace Adkins called yeah. it one time. <laughs> that's hilarious. After the flood, yeah. when everything got remodeled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's about time. It's but good then, time. Without the flood, when do you find time? With a weekly show, I know the longest running in, in entertainment history, yeah. closing in on ninety nine years yeah. now in October. When do you find time to remodel? That's true. Well, I, I, yeah, it, it was forced to close down, so yeah. I guess might as well have a hundred year flood. It. That'll take care. <laughs> of it. I know that'll take care of it. <laughs> oh 
man. Let's let's hope that didn't happen again yeah, in a hundred years. Let's not. As a local, yeah. were how were you affected by that? You know, I lived at the time. I lived over in Germantown, so we actually did take on a bunch of water around Bicentennial Mall. But my um, my I was lived in a condo. We were actually up on a slight hill. So we didn't lose anything, but we were basically an island yeah. for, for about four days. Um, and our hotel studio was that way. Yeah. The Magnolia oh. Lobby studio did not take on any water because it was the highest point in all of the, we were just up there on the island like you just described. But that's when you guys went out to the tower, right? Yeah, we had to evacuate the building. Oh yeah, the, yeah. It was just that small portion wasn't affected. Yeah, the Cascades had 13 feet of water where the main lobby check-in is. It so, really yeah, lived we, we up had to, to its, we had to its get name, out. didn't yeah. it? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You remember it was on? It started on a Friday that weekend. Yeah. yeah. And that Monday, Charlie and I were sitting at the tower facility, which had never been a studio, between the 50,000 watt transmitter and the backup 50,000 watt transmitter. I mean, was there even a place to sit down? We've got, they built us kind of a radio shack setup to get us mm -hmm. on the air, keep us on the air, because we never went off the air. Yeah. And we were sitting behind a sign, big yellow sign that said, danger, high voltage. <laughs> <laughs> Explains a lot of my memory issues today. Right. Yeah, we so. were taking yeah. on copious, Radiation. copious amounts <laughs> of RF, let me tell you. Oh, no. <laughs> That's incredible. We haven't been back out to the tower since. So. <laughs> <laughs> we like our new spot. But you have a new album out. This is yeah. so cool. Congratulations are coming out. It's, it's not out yet. Yeah, it's coming Plus. out next week. Um, it's it's my ninth studio album. If, if anybody gets past two records in the record business, you're doing pretty good. That's right. So I feel, I feel really uh, very blessed to have made music, you know, for the past 20 years. Um, but yeah, it's called The Ache, and I grew up over in West Nashville. So my dad is from Nashville. My mom is from a little town called Waverly, um, about an hour outside of town. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was a kid, my, my mom would drop me off at this babysitter's house over in West Nashville. She was a very country lady. Her name was Mamie Curtis. And Mamie made fresh biscuits for my mom. I'm, I'm not making this up every single morning. So she would send my mom off with a biscuit. My mom was a hairdresser. So she would drop me off at my babysitter's house. And I, would, I was there with her kids and a couple of neighbor kids. And my dad, unfortunately at that time, had stepped out of our, our lives for a couple of years. And when I was playing in the backyard of my babysitter's house in West Nashville, I could look in the distance and see this orange and blue sign. You know, the Tennessee Hills, mm -hmm. you know, like over in Bellevue, those yeah, beautiful rolling yeah. hills. You could see this orange and blue sign. It was a Howard Johnson sign. And that is where my dad worked. And while he was out of our life, I knew that's where he worked. And, I, and every once in a while, I could just stand at a place in the backyard and I could see that sign in the distance. And I felt this ache, this longing for mm. him. And I've felt that for years, you know, I, when I'm missing my wife or my little girls, I can just tell them, I can say to my wife, I'm feeling the ache. Mm. And she'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided, you know what, I'm gonna write a whole record around that feeling um, and I need to tell you, my dad did come back in my life a few years later and we, he passed away seven years ago and we have a great relationship, but I will never forget that feeling. And you know, there's still a few twinges of how old were you when that was going on? I would have been four. So, you know, four to six years old, a little boy needs his dad in his life mm -hmm. and, and dad would come back into my life and. He was with me at the Opry that night when I was in the revolving door. Um, he was he was a great man. He just made some he made some poor choices in his twenties, uh, and I I grew up to forgive him and realize that parents are human beings just like anybody else is. And so yeah, that's that's the impetus behind the record. This is Coffee Country and Cody. From our new Acuff House studio home on the Grand Ole Opry Plaza, 
We welcome Brandon Heath and his brand new music from The Ache, which comes out a week from tomorrow, wherever you get your music. Mm. It'll be there. Uh, <laughs> I was just reading. <laughs> I have to share this. Randy Travis's recollection of meeting Roy Acuff mm-hmm. said, from our very first meeting, he made Lib and I feel like we were a part of the family. On our first meeting, he said, boy, don't ever let those record company people talk you into singing pop. Don't let your hair grow long, and you'll be okay. (laughs) That's amazing. I'm seeing Randy Travis with long hair right now. Oh, my gosh. He kind of did go through a stint, though, where it got a little longer. Shaggy. It got a little shaggy. Yeah, Yeah, but it was the mullet era. It it was. Randy, you still look good, by the way, if you're listening this (laughs) morning. Can we talk about Stephen Curtis Chapman? Oh, remember the Grand Ole Opry? Speaking of amazing hair evolution, (laughs) Stephen Curtis Chapman. Have y'all seen some of the old photos of him? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, you know, we were talking maybe off the air. I used to come here. No, I think we were on. I used to come here as a kid, and I'm pretty sure I would have seen Stephen perform. I, I, on the opera or on oh. country on the, music USA. Yeah. Country music yeah. USA. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, cause I know he used to impersonate a ton of people, um, as you know, as they did in the show, they would sing their hits and, um, but I know, I know that it was like a dream of his to be here on the Opry stage, you know, growing up in Paducah, Kentucky, mm-hmm. his parents love bluegrass, his brother, um, who I'm forgetting his name right now. I've gotten to tour many times with Steven. Um, for about 12 years, we had the same manager. We shared a manager. So we were, we were always in each other's sphere. And I, I, to see the video of him being brought to his knees, Mm -hmm. being invited, uh, to be a member of the Grand Ole Opry, I know is like, he didn't even think to dream it. Yeah. It's the coolest video. I When it happened, I think we were all texting each other back and forth, and we all thought, exactly, yes, he is yeah. the perfect one. But it does mean a lot, especially to somebody in the CCM world, because yes. you're thinking this is contemporary Christian music yes. that's also being welcomed into country music's biggest stage. So You know, I remember the first time I was invited to sing on the Opry, and I just thought, Really? I can sing on the Opry. How long ago was that? I think it would have been in 2012 when okay. I, I came out with a very more, like more country centric record called Blue Mountain. And I'm sure my publicist was just brave enough to ask, like, could we have our, our kid Brandon on the on the show? Um, but Pete Fisher was was here at the time, also a, a friend of mine. So I think that probably helped a little bit. <laughs> um, but I remember uh, just walking out onto that stage into the circle. And I mean, as a kid, I, I would just stand in awe of the Opry, you know, and I, I grew up on country. So for me, I have a reverence to country and it seemed like I was trespassing a little bit. You know what I mean? I really did. Well, is my memory correct or not? But the first time you ever joined us, was it not in the green room backstage at the, at the Opry when we were doing a morning show remote? I swear that was the first time we met. Well, Charlie, your memory is better than mine. <laughs> if, that, if that is right, it, it, it very well could have been. Um, the first time I came in the building, I was actually working. Uh, it was the, C, the CMA week. I was working for a radio broad, broadcast company called MJI. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You remember MJI? Absolutely. So it was my job to uh, escort the artists around to do interviews. Um, and You were a talent wrangler. I was a talent wrangler, that's what I was. Which I, probably meant we were really annoying because we were like, okay, wrap it up. You know, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta get them to the next booth, you know? But I remember, again, I felt like I was trespassing. I just didn't feel like Aww. I was worthy to be there. So for somebody to say, you're worthy to stand on the mm-hmm. stage of the Grand Ole Opry was huge. And I, I gotta say, whoever's responsible for that thank you you know mm-hmm. and i know post malone was here what last week a couple mm-hmm. weeks yeah mm-hmm. the thing is what what i've heard it actually it actually used to be really hard to to get on the stage and it, it's still difficult to get on the stage you gotta you know you have to have some talent <laughs> to be on the stage the first time that i performed i actually invited dina carter to come with me because Dina and I had written a song on my record, Blue Mountain. 
and we were backstage and Dina said, you know, I've actually never gotten to perform on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry before. And I said, really, why is that? And she said, you know, I was just kind of the bad girl of country music back then and nobody really ever invited me. And to me, to invite a, a brilliant, great artist who really helped shape country in the 90s mm-hmm. onto her first time onto the stage, I was like, I'm so th- <laughs> thankful and I'm sorry that I get to have to be the guy to invite you onto the stage. <laughs> That's pretty cool. But the fact that you guys are allowing guys like Post Malone onto the stage, I think that shows where we've come, you know, as, as country music. Mm-hmm. And he totally embraced it. He was the last oh, guy yeah. to leave. Actually wound up hanging out and visiting with a security guard on the way out. Isn't no cool? kidding. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It was just he that kind it. of night. I it. saw you post pictures, Kelly. <laughs> that was awesome. I kind of love him. And um, <clears throat> it, it, You know what made the Stephen Curtis Chapman invite so special yeah. was that Ricky Skaggs, yeah. a fellow Kentuckian, oh, yeah. yes. got to do it. So it's yeah. kind of Eastern Kentucky meets Western Kentucky yeah. in the middle in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. <laughs> I can tell you guys always have a lot of forethought on who does the the invitation. I remember watching Carrie Underwood's invitation, and it was Garth Brooks, a fellow Oklahoman, you know? Mm-hmm. So there's some forethought. That's the thing. If people, people wonder why this is the longest-running radio show, I think it's just because tradition is really important to us in Tennessee, and we th- we think we think about it a lot. You know, we're we're pretty thoughtful people, I think. So the fact that y'all ran out to the old uh, tower to make sure this thing didn't stop. <laughs> that's, that's us, y'all. Yeah. It, it's not going to take us down. Carrie Underwood, Randy Travis invited her. Oh, it was Randy and Travis. And inducted her. Oh, that's, that's what it yeah, was. Because she had this great story about the crowd was going crazy the night yeah. she was invited. And she didn't realize yeah. that it wasn't her performance. It was the fact that at the end of her performance, Randy Travis was walking out on stage <laughs> and she didn't see him, but the audience did. Oh and she my thought, goodness. Carrie, girl, you are on fire. You've arrived. Tonight. You've and arrived. And then she realized that yeah. Randy Travis was coming out, and that's what happened. Brandon Heath, for all the dads who are watching and listening this morning, who will never be the same after hearing that performance. <laughs> never and win. the moms, I'm oh, crying wow. over here. <laughs> From The Ache, which is the full album that comes out a week from tomorrow, fresh off a performance at the Grand Ole Opry, Grammy nominee, multiple Dove Awards to his credit, and a longtime friend of Coffee Country and Cody. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, let's take a road trip. TNTrailsAndByways.com. That's where it starts. Get off the beaten path and take the scenic route. Could be an unassuming restaurant or a secret swimming hole. And you can find 16 self-guided driving routes. If you log on at tntrailsandbyways.com, just as you scroll down the least little bit, you'll see, see the trails. And then you can link to each trail, 16 of them total, with 1,351 recommended stops. Charlie Maddox, you've got a guide over there. Well, if you go to tntrailsandbyways.com, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can sign up for your very own guide. They will mail this to your home. It's also available at all the, the Tennessee rest stops throughout the state. But you can travel like a local, 156 pages of Tennessee goodness, including the only thing that, uh, well, Bill Cody's the only one who know how to actually use one of these things. But this is <laughs> this is the fold-up map of Tennessee map. that comes with it. Uh, I have the fold-up uh, Waze app uh, that I <laughs> you used to get me where I need to go, but tntrailsandbyways.com. 95 <laughs> counties in Tennessee, and you can discover places you never knew you always wanted to visit when you start at tntrailsandbyways.com. Kelly Sutton, update us on the top stories in country music entertainment this morning. Well, you know, we are getting another episode, another season of Yellowstone. We're very excited about that. And I think maybe Riley Green is secretly auditioning (laughs) to be a part of Yellowstone. Or maybe even 1883. Because he has that old Western cowboy look down. He posted some pictures on his Instagram and all the ladies said, hello. Oh, oh, cowboy. He looks, looks like Dennis Weaver as McLeod. I'm telling you, it's not, not a bad look for Riley. Here's what it really boils down to. He was actually in filming a video for the song that he has now with Ella Langley. 
It's called You Look Like You Love Me. If you want to see more of Riley and Ella, then you can watch the entire video. Also, Riley is still working on his new bar that's going to be coming open. I don't know when, but it's over in Midtown. It's called Riley Green's Duck Blind. And in case you were wondering, that is Carl, his dog, making a cameo <laughs> in that video. It's Carl the Cowboy Dog. He has his own Instagram. Have you guys been following along with Carl? It depresses me when animals have way more followers than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so don't look at Carl's following because okay. he's pretty massive. Okay, Lainey Wilson is killing it. We know that. The new album, Whirlwind, is out right now. She's been doing all kinds of appearances. It doesn't matter if she's in a big stadium or if she's at NPR's Tiny Desk. She is a superstar. Here's what that performance looked and sounded like. A bus for I got a house Cause it's what dreams make you do Hitting them neon honky tongs Here's the thing I love so much about Lainey, and this is why she is a bona fide superstar. If you're watching us right now on Circle Country, any of our streaming outlets, you're watching her do the same facial expressions, the same movements that she did at CMA Fest when she did this song. But she's at the NPR Tiny Desk where there's just tchotchkes and books behind her and they're all crammed in on top of each other. She gives 110 percent no matter where she is and no matter if it's just the camera crew that's sitting there watching her she's just amped up and i love it i have to say i think the reason why i love this series is that is that 80 square feet that they're in is my loft uh, in our part that's the 80 square feet i've been bequeathed so that's what my loft looks like really yeah if you just change the books for for record albums and oh, that's so, exactly so what it looks like. how long have y'all been married uh together 21 years married 19 so you think uh on your 20th anniversary, you'll get an extra 20 square feet? No, I don't know where, where it would come from. Uh, yeah. The rest of the house is... Absolutely. Sweetheart, I yeah. bequeath you 20 yeah. more square feet. I mean, we'd have to get stuff. rid of some pillows or, so no. we, we couldn't, or candles. candles. We can't do that. I think so. it's the other way around. She's taking 20 feet, so just get ready. Yeah. That's yeah. going to disappear. Okay. Um, in case you want to see Lainey, she is out on tour. Country School Again is the name of the tour. And, of course, Whirlwind is the name of the album. It is out right now. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. I literally have had it on repeat, and every day I find a new one that I love. Um, my new one that I'm listening to off of it is called Counting Chickens, and it is so good. So I just can't say enough good things about Lainey. Okay, Chris Stapleton is teasing us, but we're not exactly sure what he's got up his sleeve. So he posted on Instagram a picture of a disco ball and just a little caption that says, I think I'm in love with you tomorrow at noon central, which is actually today. So you're looking at it right there. That just says tomorrow I think I'm in love with you tomorrow, noon central. What does it mean? I think a lot of people are thinking that he is going to release his duet with Dua Lipa. So the new song is Think I'm in Love With You. You guys have heard it, mm -hmm. but he's going to probably work it up with Dua Lipa. That is my guess. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there, and I'm a big fan of that. As soon as we find out, of course, we'll let you know. Or you can log on and follow him because he's going to reveal it today at noon. And what, what if he goes back and does all his hits disco? I would love that. Huh? I am for that. The, the group <laughs> that he gets mistaken for or was mistaken for at the Grammys, <laughs> Leonard Skinner. Some guy said, hey, man, I love your music. And he was like, great. And he think he was thinking, I, this man has no idea. He said, do you know who I am? And he said, yeah, man, aren't you in Leonard Skinner? So <laughs> thought he was one of the Van Zandt boys. Johnny over there, if you're watching on television on the right, follow Brother Ronnie, who died tragically in the plane crash. This is Coffee, Country, and Cody. More Coffee, Country, and Cody is on WSM. Fresh off a performance at the Grand Ole Opry, Po Ramblin' Boys in the house this morning on Coffee, Country, and Cody with a brand new album called Wanderers Like Me that's available now wherever you get your music. And in studio with us this morning, we'll start over there on the far side. That's Josh Renkel, guitar and vocals. Laura Orshaw, who brought her fiddle so you'd know exactly what she plays. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Jasper Lorenzen, who's the bass player with Poland right. and the Boys. And great to have you all here. Let's go back to the Opry. I was looking at your socials and all those wonderful pictures you posted. Oh, yeah. How many times now? This is our third time on the Opry. But you're celebrating the release of the album with all this going on, too. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yep. And it, 
worked out perfectly because the last time we played was the day the album released so that was really cool that was it just kind of worked out that way and uh man it was awesome great way to celebrate that's yeah for sure. I, <laughs> yeah it's the best way to put out an album awesome sure. release day that's it. So. and it was laura's birthday that day what yeah, it, it was. was yeah so yeah. the the offer got to sing her happy birthday Okay, that's really never in my wildest dreams. <laughs> twenty nine, <laughs> twenty nine, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, they, they say twenty. They say twenty two. Good for I you. Mean, <laughs> hey, that's right. <laughs> Listen, my mom, bless her heart, was forty for years and years and years, and then she has a birthday coming up this coming Saturday, and she actually quoted me the wrong age. To this day, she's going to be 81. And she's like, well, I'm turning 80. And I was like, no, mom, you turned 80 last year. So if you start early enough, you just keep it going. You even fool yourself. Mom knows yeah. best. Mom yep. knows best. That's it. It's just a number. It is. Well, this time tomorrow, you'll be in Woodstown, New Jersey. When you leave here, I guess you hit the road and Delaware, the Delaware Valley Bluegrass Festival, which a lot of people know that festival. Yep. And then Brunswick, Maine on the 31st, Thomas Point Beach Bluegrass Festival. So it's still festival time, late summer, that's early right. fall coming on. It is. And then the Watermelon Pickers Festival, that's oh. September the 6th in Berryville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. You're going to be there. So some of the upcoming mm -hmm. dates. And you can find us at the thepoeramblinboys.com. Well, take us back a decade to East Tennessee and how... These bandits all got together to play great music. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you go ahead, Jess. Yeah, I man. mean, it's quite the story, really. I mean, we uh, CJ, who couldn't be with us this morning, he was kind of the one that uh, he was tasked uh, to put together a band to play at the Old Smoky Moonshine Distillery there in Gatlinburg. If any of y'all have ever been to Gatlinburg, uh, that distillery started, I think, in 2010 uh, was the year. Or maybe, yeah, I think it was 2010. And their thing was they had music every single day of the week from noon until 10 o'clock at night. So they'd always have two bands come in and play, you know, noon to five and then five to 10. And the bands would do 45 minute shifts and take 15 minute breaks. So uh, they asked him if he could put together a band. So he, um, he got on the phone right away and he called Josh over here and he called Jeremy, our banjo player. And they were living up in Kentucky at the time. And uh, he talked them into quitting their jobs they moved down to East Tennessee, and I was working <laughs> in the distillery at the time. I was pouring samples. Oh, and wow. I thought you looked familiar. Yeah. yeah they, <laughs> uh, do they have rules against uh, sampling the samples while you're pouring the samples? Only it's, it's, gotten more, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's gotten more strict recently. It was pretty loosey-goosey, but okay. it was like the Wild West back then. Okay. okay. But, uh, and we'd kind of known each other from different things, but didn't know each other well. It was kind of just a, hey, how's it going thing. Um, but he knew I played bass, so they kind of they needed someone to play bass, so they talked it amongst each other and finally talked themselves into letting me have an audition, which the audition was playing on a Sunday, which they had the whole day on Sundays. It wasn't two bands. It was just one band playing. Ten so we hours. went in and played noon to ten that day, and that was my first day playing with the band, and we just got up and played all these songs that I didn't know. And uh, at the end of it, you know, CJ, we went home that night and CJ called me Monday and said, well, if you want to do it full time, you can, you know, we'll hire you. So it, uh, I called old Smokey and said, all right, I'm done. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to pour shots anymore. But I'll be so, back tomorrow. Yeah, but I'll, yeah. I'm yeah, done, but I'll see you. <laughs> oh, I bet that was. So yeah, that, that By was. By the way, CJ's listening in this morning. He said to tell y'all hello. Hello. And, uh, and, and run the full listening. band lineup with the three of you here representing the whole band. Yeah. Who are the other members? Yeah, so we have CJ Lewandowski, who does the mandolin and vocals. And like I said, he's the one that kind of spearheaded the whole operation. And then Jeremy Brown, uh, he's the high tenor singer and the banjo player mm -hmm. in the band. So oh, the five of us make up uh, the Poe Ramble Boys. So, Laura, how did you come to this outfit? <laughs> well, I just snuck in, as you can tell from the yeah. band name. They weren't expecting me. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> but I, uh, I met the band when we uh, were playing the Ralph Stanley Festival together. I was there with the Danny Paisley and the Southern Grass. And growing up in Pennsylvania, I heard Danny Paisley's music since I was a baby. So uh, they all are big fans of Danny Paisley as well. So they came out to watch his set, and he has a pretty iconic lineup but his normal fiddle player TJ Lundy wasn't there he had taken a new job and couldn't get vacation time so I was filling in for a couple summers and so they all said who's this girl on stage <laughs> but uh, we became fast friends and started playing with them part-time I was living in Boston at the time and since then I've moved down and joined the band full-time that was I guess in 2017 when we all met so and you Josh oh uh, well I met CJ in 2008 
At the, was he pouring shots back then too? He, he was not. He was. Uh, <laughs> I actually met him at Jerusalem Ridge Bluegrass Celebration, oh, which okay. was at Bill Monroe's home place sure. there in Rosine, Kentucky. And uh, I met Jeremy way before that uh, in 2004 when I randomly bought a banjo with some extra money I had as a kid, and and uh, I didn't know what it was or what you're supposed to do with it. I just knew that I had this money that I wanted to spend and that was all I could afford was a banjo. So my mom was very upset with me and she said, if you bought it, you're gonna take lessons. So she actually got me set up with Jeremy's dad, our banjo player, Jeremy and his dad to take lessons. And they said, well, we don't really give lessons, but if you wanna travel on the road with us in our band, you can carry our gear and maybe you can watch us play and you'll pick up on it. So that's how I got into it. It was <laughs> <laughs> roadie for hire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then like wow. me me and Jeremy, you know, we, we grew up together because of that and going to different festivals and that's when we ran into CJ at, at Jerusalem Ridge and that was in two thousand eight. Wow. So it was two thousand fourteen when CJ uh called me and Jeremy to come down to Gatlinburg to start playing at Old Smokey. Wow. Well, the yeah. new album is Wanderers Like Me, and again, it came out, you debuted it at the Grand Ole Opry. And is there a connection to your grandfather with the cover art? Yeah, that's right. So the if anyone's seen it... And, I, and you will on television. I should have a copy. I, it was kind of a... Uh, oh, there you go. So that art uh, was painted by my great-grandfather, Henry Lorenzen, and he was a frontier artist in North Dakota. He was born in 1900, and at that time... You know, North Dakota in 1900 was still very much the Wild West. So he grew up seeing a lot of uh, Native Americans still, you know, living in encampments and teepees, a lot of, uh, you know, pretty wild horses, you know, running on the plains um, and just different things like that. So he used that inspiration and did a lot of, of art like that. A lot of, uh, you know, like you see in this, it's we, the name of that painting is Rider in a Storm. And uh, he did a lot of stuff like that. Like I said, a lot of the Indian encampments, uh, a lot of buffalo, just, you know, plains, frontier art. Mm -hmm. And um, CJ, um, well, and all the guys in the band had seen this art, you know, throughout their time knowing me because I have it hanging in my house. My parents have it. My grandparents, everyone has, a lot of my family has this art. So when we were putting this album together, uh, CJ called me and said, hey, what do you think about using one of those paintings as the, the, the cover for this album? I was like, well, yeah, that'd be cool. So I started photographing with my phone different uh, different paintings throughout the, you know, when I'd go visit family, and I got probably accumulated 50 different ones and put them all in a Dropbox folder, and they randomly, I didn't even have a choice, they picked that painting, which <laughs> was fine with me. I, I think it's a really neat painting. So. You're going to win either way, right? Yeah, I, I think it's cool either way, and it kind of honors him, and uh, it's it's a it's a cool thing. So, yeah, his name was Henry, Henry Lorenzen, and you can Google him my – my great aunt wrote a book about him actually a few years ago. So you can, there's a website and people can find out more about uh, my great grandfather that way if they want to. 